Eine Stunde? Digga, was? Okay, das gucken wir uns an. Holy shit. Eine Stunde geht der Lachs. Zeit für eine drei stunden reaktion Let's go! Also die Channel 5 Videos sind ja grundsätzlich immer eine absolute Granate, ne? Also das ist was, was, was da produziert wird, ist auf einem verrückten Level. Ich weiß nicht, wie Twitch damit umgeht, aber man sieht nekrotisierte Körperteile. Ach, Twitch, Digga. Vor ein paar Wochen wurden noch Pimmel und Tiddies in die Kunstkategorie gemalt und man konnte damit rumwackeln und getwerkt wurde. Da wird man jetzt wohl doch den ein oder anderen nekroti nekrotisierten Fuß sehen dürfen, Digga. So ein Ding ist das. Seid ihr bereit? Let's go! Hey, my name is Ra. We in Kensington, Philadelphia. North Philadelphia, to be exact, somewhat. So it's known for a lot of drug use, crime. So, wo soll ich hin? Warte mal, warte mal, warte mal, warte mal. Links unten sieht gut aus. Links unten sieht gut aus. Drug use, prostitution. What are the most popular drugs here right now? The Trank, the Dope, and uh, the Fentanyl. What's up, baby? It's doing them dirty, like bad. Like Philadelphia, wir haben, könnt ihr euch daran erinnern? Oh, vielleicht einige nicht, ne? Aus unerklärlichen Gründen sind die Zuschauerzahlen hier nochmal gewachsen. Keine Ahnung wieso, Alter. Und was soll das alles? Könnt ihr, was, was macht ihr? Habt ihr nichts Besseres zu tun? Aber vor ein paar Monaten haben wir ein Video gesehen, wo einer aus einem Auto rausgefilmt hat und hat die Bürgersteige von Philadelphia gefilmt und gezeigt, wie Obdachlose das förmlich bevölkern. Also wirklich, die leben da. Straßenzüge voll. Richtig krass. Das ist richtig krass. My mother is from down here. My mother used to do every drug in this book. Glad to say she uh, she's clean off of everything. But me, when I was when I was a child, my mother was down here doing dope. She did not look like this. She had a couple track marks. She had a couple little sores and everything. But her limbs wasn't falling off. It's real bad. Like you can smell them when they walk past. Like, do you guys believe addiction is a disease? Yes, it is. Some people want to get off drugs, but they so they so deep into it they can't. No matter how hard they try. They've been doing it for so long, it becomes a part of them. What do you think is the solution for someone who's that far in the lifestyle of drug addiction? Well, by honest opinion, I don't think there's no solution. Then they're gonna do it till they die. Uh, there's a fight right behind us. All right, that's it, you got him, that's it. That's it. You stealing? You can't steal. You can't steal. Da bing, da bing, da bing. No, 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 no more, no more. Get up, go. This is a typical- What the f What the f Day in Kensington, a neighborhood in Philadelphia. 400 to 800 people are on the streets here looking for their next high. What's your name? Bud. How long have you been out here? Almost four years. I think it's crazy. Was in Amerika, ich weiß gar nicht, ob das in Philadelphia auch so ist. Hat Philadelphia auch so unheimlich liberale Drogenpolitik? Das, also das ist wirklich krass. Es, es ist wirklich krass. Aber... Ich bin mir nicht sicher, ob Philadelphia auch so eine liberale Drogenpolitik hat. Ich, der, der Anschein ist schon so. Das Problem ist, ach, wir, wir gucken einfach hin. Wir, wir haben schon so viel über diese Sch geredet. Lass uns einfach mal die, bevor ich jetzt am Anfang der Doku schon sage, wie die Doku sehen, äh, aussehen wird, lass uns die Doku gucken. <lacht> when do you think you first started doing drugs? I tried drugs when I was 18. I used heroin I was Da liegt einfach jemand rum, Bro. 22. So in that period of time, you can kind of see when the writing's on the wall. You know, it's a spiral downward, and eventually it takes you to somewhere like this. Honestly, if I'm being truthful, I'm probably gonna have to get arrested to stop. But when I do, when I do get arrested, it's at that point, you know, I, I'd like to move forward into sobriety. I've had five years clean, two. Jesus Christ, Digga. Two years clean, a year and a half clean. Um, hi, Mom. I'm okay. Love you. And if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God is raised ah! the dead, you'll be saved. We are all the same. We have all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And like I okay, war vielleicht doch ein bisschen zu viel nekrotische Körperteile für, für mich. <lacht> Ach du Scheiße, Digga. Da kommen noch mehr die nächsten 10 Minuten. Ich werde versuchen, immer zu schreien und wegzuschalten. There's no gender, Digga? But there is no difference in salvation with respect to gender. If you're a man, you get saved. If you're a woman, you get saved. Let me tell you something. A man will not get to heaven if he's a and doesn't repent of his home 
Audi. Digga, was? Was, Alter, was? Hat er gerade da... Das ist jetzt aber schnell eskaliert. Ich dachte, der macht da so eine positive Ansprache so. Ihr könnt es schaffen. Ihr könnt aus der Drogenabhängigkeit rauskommen. Ihr könnt es schaffen. Männer und Frauen, ihr werdet alle in den Himmel kommen. Aber wehe, ihr seid homosexuell. Ihr kommt in die Hölle. Ihr werdet in der Hölle, in der Hölle schmoren. Aber alle anderen, Bruder, kommt in den Himmel. Ich denke, what the fuck? Was ist denn mit ihm? Was? Do you use any of the harm reduction services they offer right here? Um, yeah, we use the uh, needle exchange. Then with harm reduction, they offer uh, like wound care. What's going on with the wound on your leg, man? So, what it is... is okay, es hier steht jetzt das. Ich werde jetzt weg... Ich, ich werde jetzt wegschalten, Chat. Ich werde jetzt... Ich werde jetzt wegschalten, Chat, ja? Ich... Ich werde jetzt wegschalten. Ich, äh, ich beschreibe euch, was ich sehe. It's a, it's a sore that's caused by an abscess. How does that happen? We're not really sure, to be honest. Uh, uh, most of us think it's the trank that does it. The dangerous street drug component is... <coughs> um, das sah nicht gut aus, Chat. Is officially called xylazine, nicknamed Trank, as in tranquilizer. For people who use illicit drugs, it is an X factor, both unseen and possibly fatal. City officials and the feds say Trank is being mixed with opioids. Uh, my name is Rosalind Pichardo, founder of Operation Save Our City. I work with families of homicide victims and I'm a harm reductionist. So what is xylazine? So xylazine is like a tranquilizer not made for human consumption it's made wäre das tosco geworden nee ich glaube nicht aber es war schon sehr eklig ich habe das bild förmlich gerochen wirklich es war so na na for animals it's used on mice is used on on it's like a sedative that's made it into the sub, drug supply i mean it's been here for six years but we're seeing it a lot more now a drug commonly used to sedate horses is now being linked to overdose deaths across the country. Trank was detected in 34% of all overdose deaths in 2021. It's like a vasoconstrictor, it constricts your, your vein. Wenn du sowas hörst, ne? Also wenn du sowas hörst, wenn du sowas hörst, denkst du dir, Bruno, nehm doch lieber Crack. So, ich kann, ich meine, Crack war auch ganz schön beschissen. Aber Crack hat doch nicht so viele Leute getötet. Die Leute sterben ja wie die Fliegen von diesem ganzen... Fentanyl, Tranquilizern, dieses ganze Zeug, die sterben ja wie die Fliegen, Alter. Wann ist Crack denn zu teuer geworden? War Crack nicht mal die günstige Alternative zu diesem teuren White Heroin? <lacht> Sachsensplitter. <lacht> Stimmt, so heißt das auch. <lacht> oh Gott, ich habe ganz vergessen, was das für Bezeichnungen gibt für Crack. <lacht> I'm sorry. <lacht> Oh Gott. Oh nein. Oh mein Gott, nein. Oh. Also wirklich, es ist, es ist nicht vorstellbar. Die Opioid- oder die Opiumkrise in den, in, in den Staaten findet auf einem Level statt. Es ist verrückt. And it just makes it hard to circulate. And then next thing you know, you got infection, you have amputation, you have rotting skin. They say that, like, the filler is like really acidic it's like when you get a cut it's ich like, die ganze Zeit Angst dass es gezeigt wird shit like almost like the acid tries to get out of your system like through like the weak point or something in your veins you know so it's like these wounds they don't they don't heal man i've had this on my leg for like over a year over a year the same size man and have you attempted to get any like healthcare for it nothing uh, official you know but um i do take care of it clean gauze soap and water um Yes. Es tut mir leid, ich muss immer wieder wegschalten. Oh, uh, Meta Honey. So, I have a lot of wound care supplies. I had a lot of snacks, socks. It's just not enough. We may have like maybe six, seven teams um, out here from different hospitals, but it's just more or less the, the magnitude of people that are here coming from all over the country mm. to, to consume this stuff that's not even not made for human consumption. I would say 70% are not from here. 70-80% are not from here. I'm from Baltimore. I went to rehab like a month ago. And I ended up leaving. Ist er am Bluten? Warte mal. Alter, ich tut mir leid, warte. Ist er am Bluten? With a girl that's from here. And been here ever since. And basically got stuck down here. I got a family back home in Baltimore with three kids. 
And this shit's different. Like okay, ich kann es nicht zeigen. Ich, also ich, ich, ich schalte mal, ich muss es weg. Das ist crazy. Also ich gehe mal davon aus, der ist vom, der hat sich irgendwie Ketchup über seinen Körper geschmiert. Aber ich, ich bin mir nicht sicher. Darum warte ich mal ganz kurz, damit ich, damit ich sicher sein kann, was das ist. Äh, Leute, ne? Also hört gerne zu. Moment. Like, totally different. We took a trip back one time and got the dope and it does nothing now. So basically, I'm up here because this shit is not fucking different. Like they come here because we have that. Holy shit, Alter, was ist in dir, Alter? Ich bin fünf Minuten drinne. Ich habe. Das ist natürlich eine sehr extreme Sache, ne? Der Grund, warum ich, ich glaube, um das mal zu zu. Der Grund, warum ich wegschalte, ist nicht, weil ich denke, dass ich deswegen gebannt werde. Was Bannen und Twitch-Sachen angeht, denke ich, dass diese, dass das hier kein Problem ist. Der Grund, warum ich wegschalte, ist, weil es teilweise echt extrem ist und da geht es eher um euch als um Twitch. Ne? Also da bin ich so ein bisschen auf Papa-Basis. Auf Papa-Basis versuche ich dann so ein bisschen, ne? ja, das, äh, das kurz mal nicht zu zeigen, okay? Also nur damit ihr versteht, ja. Good shit, you know. They come here because we got that good drug. Um, this is wild, bro. I've never seen something like this shit ever, ever in my life. Like, like Baltimore's ran by the gangs and shit. Bruder, hier ist der straight up blutet von seinem Hals und steht da als, als, als würde er Feierabend machen. Like, train ain't even hit Baltimore yet. Like, I'm telling you, when it hits Baltimore, that shit's about to be a war zone because. Nothing else gonna get anybody high. What's going on with your uh, right arm here, man? I and somebody missed and I ended up getting a blood infection and I was septic. Like last week, I was in ICU for four days. Do you know what might have caused it? Uh, Trank and a coat. What about you, man? Well, look, What's my voice is mangled because when I was getting hit, somebody was hitting me, they hit my voice box. Or I think, I mean, that's what they say, but I'm going on like three weeks. I'm on Trank is nasty shit. It's an animal tranquilizer that was used on horses. You can look look around and see and go, ooh, ooh, ooh. Oh. Holy shit, Alter. Holy shit, Alter. War das eine offene Wunde? Das war eine offene Wunde, Digga. Ey, ich kann es gerade nicht zeigen, aber wir haben gerade mehrfach... Also, das war unangenehm. Ultimately, it's not that person's fault. Take so, the fucking track away. My fucking leg. Oh, I'm embarrassed. Oh, mein Gott. Also... Oh mein Gott, Digga. I, I wash, clean, put antibiotic fucking ointment on it, wrap it every day. Every time I can, I'm in that shower. This has been here for five fucking months. The flesh eating condition caused by Trank is referred to. Okay, das ist mit medizinisch. Jetzt sieht man, jetzt sieht man, was ich nicht, uh, jetzt sieht man, was ich nicht zeigen kann as necrotizing fasciitis. This condition was mentioned briefly during my visit to a harm reduction facility in San Francisco. Necrotizing fasciitis, which is a flesh-eating disease. But I wanted to learn more about what's actually going on beneath the skin when you see these types of lesions. So I found a dermatologist named Dr. Cartwright to help break it down. Sure, I'm Martina Cartwright. I'm the Vice President of Medical Affairs for a small dermatology company. Xylazine is not an opioid. It's actually an anesthetic meant for uh, horses, and other large animals. So necrotizing fasciitis is just a name for dead tissue. It causes death of the fascia, which is right underneath the skin surface, and it can even go deeper than that. Mm -hmm. So what you're seeing, that blackened tissue, again, is dead tissue, and below that is a harbored infection. Mm -hmm. Now, how long after injecting Trank would it take for this condition to set in? It's hard to say, but it oftentimes only takes a few days. Treatment is very... Holy sh**, what? Nach ein paar Tagen geht das schon los. Oh Gott. Oh mein Gott. What the fuck? Wisst ihr, woran mich das erinnert? Das erste Mal, als ich von Crocodile gehört habe, ging das mit ähnlichen Symptomen einher. Da hieß es damals, ja, Crocodile ist irgendwie dieser neue russische Sch*** und dann, dann fällt ihr die Haut wie Schuppen von den, von den Knochen und so ein Sch***. Alter very complicated. You have to get the individual into the hospital right away to receive IV antibiotics. They also have to debride that wound, which means you take off the dead layers of skin and tissue. And sometimes that can go as deep as the bone. If they don't get the immediate treatment, it will spread and oftentimes cause a systemic infection called sepsis. Sepsis is a systemic infection that affects uh, all the organs. 
So it's characterized by low blood pressure, rapid heart rate, increased temperature, and high white blood cell count. And it often uh, has a very high death rate. What is the death rate? It's over 50%. Das ist alles sehr, sehr schlecht. Das ist alles sehr, 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 sehr schlecht, Digga. Is there any type of treatment for sepsis? Amputation is the only treatment. They're not getting enough blood flow and nutrients to the area where the tissue has died. And it okay. Also wenn sich in 2024, ja, einem Zeitalter der medizinischen, des vielen medizinischen Fortschritts noch gleichen, ja, oder sie seinesgleichen sucht, eine Krankheit mit, naja, wenn du es wenn so weit gekommen ist, kannst du es nur noch amputieren. Wenn es nur noch so eine Lösung gibt, dann ist das echt extrem. It just keeps spreading. You can think of it almost like water spreading in a puddle. It goes from one small place and then it spreads throughout the limb. And if they don't seek treatment to get that blood flow back in there, they're going to lose their limb. Once symptoms have progressed beyond their initial stage, which is marked by dramatic inflammation of the affected limb, the skin begins to corrode. After that, the only real option is amputation, which in America costs forty-five thousand dollars without insurance. Eine Amputation kostet vier. Habe ich? Warte mal, habe ich das gerade richtig verstanden? Which in America costs forty-five thousand dollars without insurance. So okay, fünfundvierzig tausend. Das ist eine falsche Übersetzung. Fünfundvierzig tausend. Ist trotzdem mega viel. A holy fucking 45.000 Dollar bezahlen, damit die dir das Bein abnehmen. What the fuck, bro? So it's not uncommon in Kensington for trank addicts to chop off their own limbs to stop the disease from progressing onto their internal organs. Now, I can genuinely say that in all my years reporting, I have never seen something this horrifying. And on a human level, I was struck with a piercing sense of anger and genuine frustration that there was actually someone out there, probably in plain sight, making a killing, selling Trank in Philadelphia. Fünfundvierzigtausend für das Amputieren eines Fünfundvierzigtausend für das Amputieren eines eines einer Gliedmaße. Alter, Amerika ist einfach f***, ne? Amerika ist einfach f***. An evil drug, slowly killing thousands of people in real time, who even if they miraculously get clean, will never recover from the damage it does to their body. All in the name of profit, because I guess fentanyl just wasn't enough to pay the bills. Ja. Wenn man denkt, dass Fentanyl nicht noch schon der absolute Schaufen ist, Tranquilizer ist halt wirklich krass. Also das ist halt einfach krass. What the f***, Alter? Still, it's my job as a journalist to speak to everyone. So, I asked around. Does anybody know where this stuff comes from? Comes from? I was told that at the top of the supply chain, almost all of Philadelphia's trank is created by a tight-knit pair of two brothers who've achieved a monopoly on the flow of xylazine in and out of Philadelphia after Pennsylvania Governor Josh Shapiro made it temporarily illegal six months ago for veterinarians to prescribe or even possess xylazine. Governor Shapiro is taking aggressive action to stop the spread of xylazine, also known as Trank, directing the State Department of Health to list it as a Schedule III narcotic. The Trank brothers agreed to meet with me, but wouldn't give me an exact address. They first told me to go to the parking lot of Max's Cheesesteaks in North Philly. From there, they gave me walking directions to the stash house, where the door was left wide open for me to enter. Ist das irre, Digga. And there I was, with the Walter White and Jesse Pinkman of Trank. This is the Kensington Finest. They love it. There's a lot going on. A little bit of dope, a little bit of Trank, a little bit of Fetty. This should be about like 50 grand right here. It's good for about like two thousand dollars, between two thousand and four thousand. You know, it don't cost that much, even. It don't cost that much. 
I'm sure you've seen a lot of people have died from overdoses from this stuff. Yeah. Molly Kochenberger was just 30 years old when an overdose claimed her life. Her aunt says a dangerous veterinary tranquilizer was to blame. We saw that she had fentanyl and xylosine in her system. Do you feel any sense of like responsibility? Yeah, I feel bad. They can't spend more money with me. Fuck. Yeah. Yeah. For those who don't know, what is Trank? Trank is a liquid paste. It's like a more tranquilizer, obviously. But it's already put together as we speak, though. I gotta put it in. Ich mach mal den Unter Untertitel aus, weil der gerade besser ist, wenn man ihn äh, über, die, äh, über das Video sieht. I like a blender and really get it down to a powder form, so I can get all my work from it. Get it done, get it on the streets, and do what you gotta do. I saw online that it kind of originated as like a veterinary thing, right? Yeah. Yeah, so when you get your hands on it at first, you, it's not really breaking the law until, until you really, like, put it together. Is there, like, a kind of dirty veterinarian involved somewhere along the way? Yeah, yeah. Plenty of them, plenty of them. You know, it don't cost that much anymore. He's right. For a licensed veterinarian, a bottle of xylazine, capable of doubling the strength of an ounce of fentanyl, costs only $33. There you go. Is there a limit to how much you can get at one time? Well, sometimes, yeah, sometimes. And what is that? What is that limit? So, an average bottle, I'd say we probably get about like four or five average, four or five bottles. Okay. How much is each bottle? So, an average between, I'd say, 300 to 700. It's gonna come to a thousand if, if the person really stingy don't want you to know what's going on. And it's typically veterinarians, huh? Yeah. Well, no, no, no. He's the first guy, but we talk to the fourth, fifth, sixth guy. Oh. Yeah, I don't go right to the farms and get it, no. I got some people that make runs. I don't really make runs myself, but I make sure I pay them very well to get what I need. We do what we gotta do, but I need y'all to get it here. I can't go get it myself. Do you have any of the um, bottles with you? You see that bottle right there? Yeah, that's that money right there. See my guy ain't moving. Do you kind of moderate like how much you put into the fentanyl packets? Yes, you got to. You don't want to kill them. We want them to enjoy themselves. We want to kill them. You think Trank's like a pretty enjoyable experience? Yeah, yeah. It causes an anesthetic effect. So lower heart rate, a sense of calming. It almost rivals that of heroin. Hmm, interesting. And they don't go through harsh withdrawals. What does Trank feel like? Trank makes me feel like I'm asleep. <laughs> Honestly, it's kind of like a daze. I'm from like the heroin days. You know, I'm in a... Jesus Christ, Alter. Ich bin, ich bin... Alter, ich bin fassungslos einfach, dass da, also ich, 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 da, das, das ist schwierig für mich zu verarbeiten, wenn ihr versteht, was ich meine, ne? Da steht halt einfach jemand, der das so, der das so kommerzialisiert und den Effekt auf der Straße eins zu eins sieht, also es ist vollkommen irre, also es ist vollkommen irre. For the rush, you know, uh, the, the euphoric rush from the drugs, the trend really doesn't offer that, but what it does offer is a, a, a cheap nod. How much is a single dose of uh, Trank? A single dose of Trank, like, like, in a, like in a dope bag for? Yeah. $10, five to $10. Oh, $5 for a bag of fentanyl mixed with a tranquilizer. Alter, Fentanyl gemischt mit tranquilizer. How many do you think you sell a day? Hundreds of thousands. From a distribution standpoint, the Trank brothers supply between between 15 to 20 blocks in Philadelphia every day with their own bundles of Trank. They estimate that each block alone sells 10,000 doses. So, you can that. Of a block doing 100 bundles, and there's 14 bags in a bundle. That's about 10,000. This economy generates $500,000 every day. But as we saw, costs many customers their lives and limbs. Or have you seen the effects of it on people's body? Yes, it's just like that, and it's not good. Normally, if you do the right, if you do it the right way, it won't happen like that. But if you miss, it will tear your ass off. Do you feel any sense of like responsibility for that? No, no responsibility. How come? Because I'm not the one that's giving it to him directly. So you have other people that work for you? Yes, I do. How many people do you think work under uh, you? Fifty average. What's like their average age typically? Average age, teenagers. Dealers, teenagers, older people, yeah, sometimes, but they normally the drug addicts. I see you have a, some protection on you here. Yeah, I got to, all the time. Glocks, Smith & Wesson's, Blueberry, I can put everything with our hands on, but Glocks is our favorite. 
Yeah, very, very reliable. This is a lot of robbers. Everybody can't get their hands on this stuff. Why is it so hard to get this stuff? Why? Yeah. Because we're stingy. You're not going to sell everybody. We don't want everybody getting our money. So when they see people that got blocks, that's want real good numbers. They like to rob the hustlers. And when they rob the hustlers, they're messing with me. And therefore, I got to take care of them. How do you take care of stuff? Uh, normally death. Digga, ich fass das nicht, also ich, ich, muss, ich muss mal ganz ehrlich sagen, ich fass es nicht, dass da ein Journalist isoliert mit einem Kameramann es schafft, diesen gesamten Drogenring, der das Monopol von Tranquilizer-Distribution in Philadelphia zu sein scheint, einfach zu identifizieren und mit denen zu sprechen. Es gibt ganze Organisationen von Polizeibeamten, die das nicht hinkriegen. Das wird jetzt nicht in 15 Minuten passiert sein, aber dass die das so schnell schaffen, ist schon ziemlich wild. Also wirklich wild. Oh my God. You ever shot anybody before? Yes, sir. How was that experience? I don't know. I don't remember. How did you first start doing this? Friends, poverty, no guys, and seeing that they like it better than dope. How would you describe your upbringing like in general? Um, regular, nothing crazy, regular poverty. How about your like home life? Regular. It wasn't enough. How old were you, you think, when you first started to just like figure you didn't want to work a regular job? Never worked a regular job. Really? No. Not even for like one shift at Starbucks? No. How long have you been doing this for? Uh, say about, about 10 years. How do you feel about what's going on at K&A? &A? Uh, I'm not really too far from that area, but I know my stuff is over there and they're loving it. You know? Some people got dope, some people got dope with train, some people got dope with fentanyl. So I what you need your hands on. I forgot to mention, Trank prices are kept fixed by the cartel. The original crooked veterinarian at the top of the supply chain doesn't sell to the Trank brothers or anyone directly. They sell wholesale to a broker who works for a Mexican drug cartel. What are those guys like? Sturdy. Very sturdy. They wouldn't do what I'm doing. Do they kind of control things on like a high level? Yes, they do. Prices. People lives. For my own safety, I don't want to say which one, but the cartel sets a fixed price for xylazine bottles and closely monitors Trank as it travels down the supply chain, particularly as it moves from the Trank brothers onto the blocks, like Kensington. If any blocks are found to be cutting and weakening Trank to maximize profit or getting xylazine from outside veterinarians, they would almost instantly be killed, and the cartel doesn't have to do it themselves. They can get you touched without even being here. Really? Yes, sir. They'll drop the price. Just okay. like a bag on somebody's head? Yeah, no problem. And that word just kind of circulates it's around? Right in the past year, though, this market has become increasingly difficult to regulate due to an overseas manufacturer called Hanhong Pharmaceuticals, which is an unregulated company based in Wuhan, China. China. This company, which should be a household name, is funded directly by the infamous Wuhan Institute of Virology. But I like having a YouTube channel, so I'm going to save my cross analysis for a later date. Anyway. Okay, den hat, der hat mich jetzt getroffen, den habe ich gar nicht kommen sehen, Alter. Den habe ich ja gar nicht kommen sehen, Digga. In the past year, though, this market has become increasingly difficult to regulate due to an overseas manufacturer called Hanhong Pharmaceuticals, which is an unregulated company based in Wuhan, China. This company, which should be a household name, is funded directly by the infamous Wuhan Institute of Virology. But I like having a YouTube channel, so I'm going to save my cross analysis for a later date. Any <laughs> Anyways, Hanhong Ph Anyways. <laughs> Anyways. Pharmaceuticals was recently revealed <laughs> to be the company solely responsible for selling fentanyl precursors to the Mexican drug cartels, who then bake these chemicals in a laboratory into pills and powder to import into the United States. Because of the success of the open-air trank market in Philadelphia, this company recently figured out about xylazine. And so, about a year ago, Hanhong began selling their own variant of xylazine. But instead of liquid, in a powder form, for only $20 a kilo, which they've been attempting to sell to drug dealers in Philadelphia on platforms like Telegram and WhatsApp. Unlike the trade of fentanyl, which requires the cartel as a middleman to bake the precursors, Hanhong's invention of powdered xylazine allows them to cut out the cartel as a middleman and sell directly to dealers. For a period of time, this was a real game changer for Trank dealers. They can get it off the internet. They can order it from anywhere. And what's sad is you don't even have to be in the veterinarian field. Krass, Alter. Was für eine verrückte Scheiße, Alter. To receive it really? through the mail from Chinese dealers. Wuhan kommt da nicht Covid her? Ich, hab, äh, ich, erinnere, mich an ein, <lacht> ich erinnere mich an ein Channel 5 Video, wo Andrew Kellan gesagt hat, ähm, Wuhan, 
der Ort, wo ein Mann sehr hungrig, ein sehr hungriger Mann Corona verursacht hat. <lacht> weil, er eine, weil er eine Fledermaus essen musste. So, ich, das ist halt, da kommen teilweise, da kommen teilweise sehr wilde, <lacht> da kommen teilweise sehr wilde Nebensätze einfach raus. So wirklich ganz, ganz wilde, Digga. However, this majorly weakened the control of the cartel, who had already set a fixed price for liquid xylazine bottles, leading them to impose a death sentence on anyone caught receiving or trading powdered Chinese xylazine. This green light on someone's life, however, is imposed remotely. Because Philadelphia is so poor, all the cartel has to do is contact the city's gang leaders through private channels with someone's picture, their name, and a price. In the following days, a feeding frenzy for that person's life will ensue. Three gunmen firing dozens of shots in broad daylight, killing a 19-year-old man who was sitting on some steps. From an outside perspective, it may look like gang warfare or just simply black-on-black -black crime, but it's actually a proxy. What the f***, Alter? Ist das irre? Ey, ist es Dokumentation über die amerikanische Realität in solchen Städten zu sehen, versetzt mich einfach in so eine, ich möchte fast sagen, in so eine sprachlose, in so sprachloses Staunen. Aber nicht staunen, weil man irgendwas Beneidenswertes sieht, sondern staunen, weil man sich nicht vorstellen kann, wie es zu diesem Punkt gekommen ist. Also wirklich, du sitzt da teilweise da und denkst dir, Bruder, das nächste GTA muss ganz schön viel übertreiben, um dem Ganzen noch einen draufzusetzen. Also, wie viel krasser soll denn das nächste GTA werden, dass die die Sch übertrumpfen können oder irgendwie lächerlich machen oder überspitzen? How the f war between Chinese corporations and Mexican drug cartels. For this reason, the advent of Trank in Philadelphia has led to a major spike in homicides. And almost Jesus Christ. Nobody has a bigger target on their head than the Trank brothers. What are your aspirations like for your whole life? Well, I get in and get out. I've been here for quite a while, but since the Trank and the fentanyl have been here, the profit's been very, very, very skyrocket, so. I assume we haven't doing this too long, but yeah. until then, I gotta do what I gotta do. So you do think you'll get out of the dope game eventually? Yes, I will. What do you want to do when you're out? Oh, get a business. I like cars. I like fancy cars. What's your favorite kind of car? Char Dodge Charger, Hellcat, nice. Grand Cherokee. I like money. I like money. What's your favorite way to spend money, like, after you get it? On my bitches. Bitches, food, nice. fancy cars, jewelry. Like taking girls out to restaurants? Yes. Hell yeah. What kind of food do you like? I like pastas. I like... Pizza, I like steak. Oh, sick. Most important lamb. I'm a lamb type guy. Oh, nice. What do you think's the best place in Philly to get lamb? Lamb? Here. I'm like dark skinned woman. Yeah? Yeah. Attitude or more calm? Both. Nice. Only well, you know how to fucking listen. Have you ever tried this stuff before? Fuck no. Well, never. You think drugs are harmful? Yes, it is harmful. How come? We don't like it. Why? Look, you see what it's doing? It's killing everybody. Do you feel any sense of like responsibility? No. They're gonna fucking buy it off me. You wanna sell drugs tomorrow, guess what they're gonna buy it off of? You too. Right. All kids stay away from drugs. All kids stay away from drugs. All right, guys, appreciate it. Thanks for your time. Weißt du? Und das, was er sich als. Weißt du? Das Ding ist, was dieser sehr, sehr einfache und kriminelle Mann sich als out vorgestellt hat ist halt so dieser gesellschaftliche Standard von Reichtum, ne? Von wegen Autos, Frauen, Schmuck. Also vollkommen wie ein, wie ein, du machst ein Buch auf und suchst nach dem stereotypischen reichen Dude. Nichts, was Substanz hat. Nichts. Ich mag Autos. Digga, was bist du? Ha, hi, hi, Bruder. Endlich mal jemand, der so ein Business aufmacht. So, was? Und Pasta. So also, vollkommen komisch. After leaving the Trank brothers' house, I felt conflicted. On one hand, you can say that they're evil. I do think it's evil. They're taking advantage of people that have addiction problems, mental illness. They're producing a drug that destroys people's lives and bodies. But on the other hand, even they have caveats that protect them from responsibility and give them an ethical high ground no matter what. For example, they say Trank users don't go through harsh withdrawals. And they don't go through harsh withdrawals. Meaning they're providing a less painful experience than a typical fentanyl dealer. However, we learned from Dr. Cartwright, this is not true. The come down from that drug is so horrific and painful for them, they'll check themselves out of the hospital and start all over again. 
They also claim that necrotizing fasciitis only sets in if you miss a vein. If you do it the right way, it won't happen like that. But if you miss, it will tear your ass up. Meaning, it's all the fault of the user for not doing it right. This is also false. It's more likely to happen if you miss a vein, but regardless, it, it will occur. And most interestingly, they say that if they don't do it, someone else will, framing themselves as powerless cogs in the drug machine. They're gonna fucking buy it off of me. You wanna sell drugs tomorrow, that's what they're gonna buy it off of. You too, man. I believe that at one point, probably early on, they realized that making Trank was wrong. But after seeing such astronomical profits come in, their brains constructed protective pathways to shield their souls. Das ist doch bei allen Sachen so. Das war damals bei der Industrie rund um Zigaretten verkaufen so. Das ist bei Glücksspiel in jeder Form so. Ja, das ist ja nur ich also ich sag den Leuten vorher, die sollen das nicht machen. Bruder, diese diese Mechanismen sind immer dieselben. Das ist immer derselbe Mechanismus. Immer dieses ja, wenn ich das nicht mache, macht das wer anders und ach, da kann ich doch, jeder ist für sich, jeder ist seines Glückes Schmied. <lacht> weißt du, solche Sachen. So dieses komplette moralische Isolieren. So, ich, ich, ich nutze das ja nicht, ich nutze ja wer anders. Ach, ach come on, bro. Mm, ganz, ganz bitter. Guilt. And flood their conscience with the same affirmation. Yes, what I'm selling is harmful. But if I stop, somebody will take my position. Yeah. Therefore, it is not wrong for me to profit from this, because even if I abstain from selling it, the market will continue. Yeah. Now, genau. It all reflects a deeply antisocial, alienated, nihilistic worldview, in which the individual has absolutely no power in influencing or changing the trajectory of a doomed society. Recognizing the spiritual sickness that runs through the veins of this collapsing country, greed, death, and decay become seen as absolutes. And so the alienated individual figures, they're just temporary placeholders for an omnipresent evil, an evil that will exist with or without them. I began to wonder if this psychology was shared by even more heinous criminals, like child traffickers. Or Da ist jemand, der sich nicht selbst umgebracht hat, auf jeden Fall im Bild. Or elephant poachers. Does anybody actually accept, embrace and consciously spread evil? Or do they all construct frameworks to avoid moral responsibility? And speaking of moral responsibility, what are the ethics behind what I'm doing? Is my coverage of places like Kensington unethical and kind of fucked up? Since making my last video in San Francisco, I've become aware of an entire side of the internet, particularly YouTube, that films homeless people under the guise of humanization and does huge numbers, and understandably so. Poverty is pornographic. The difference is you don't generally jerk off to homeless content or hood vlogs, but it tantalizes a similarly curious part of the brain that gets excited by the forbidden and dangerous. For that reason, Kensington is pretty much the number one homeless YouTube content zone in the country. Das sind diese Videos, die wir schon mal gesehen haben, Chat. Wo, wo die, die ich beschrieben habe, am Anfang von dem Video, wo die irgendwie da durchfahren und dann das zeigen. Holy fuck. In fact, there's like 50 YouTube documentaries up right now, just like this one. Do you know? Hay un chico que se encuentra mal y a ver si lo puede ayudar. Está desnudo. Which all follow pretty much the same marketing strategy city of zombies, further dehumanizing Americans suffering from necrotizing fasciitis, and purposely using salacious language to collect ad revenue from views. Holy f Which because of our declining attention span, which also comes as a result of a Chinese psyop called TikTok, are best driven by clickbait titles and shocking keyframes. Upon further investigation, it would appear that Kensington's largest export besides Trank is definitely content. A two-syllable term that represents the transformation of art into a flat commodity, of which value is determined solely by engagement not quality, meaning a content creator could realize that the product he's selling is bad for society, but so long as the market demand is there, he will continue. You see where I'm going with this? The Trank brothers aren't the only ones profiting from human suffering in Kensington. And many locals feel that much of the content filmed here does much more harm than it does good for the neighborhood. Holy shit, bro. Das war ein insaner Zusammenhang, der hergestellt wurde, den ich so nicht gesehen habe. Wahnsinn. Der hat einfach den Zusammenhang zwischen Drogen, Dealern und YouTubern hergestellt auf einer, in einer Basis, in der jeder, der es verstanden hat, weil er es verstanden hat, denkt, holy shit, you're right. <lacht> wow. Wahnsinn, das war ziemlich krass.
Well, everybody I see on YouTube that come down here and get some content, I feel as though it's not for the right intentions. Right from they don't yeah. ask the right questions. They just record. They try to get the best video. They try to go viral. They try to get attention to their channel, but the message ain't what it's supposed to be. You understand what I'm saying? What's up, right there? Good to meet you. There's a lot of originals right here. Everybody that walked up is literally from down here, like literally 20 plus years. Yeah, I lived down here all my life type shit. I was fucked up. Now I'm having motion blanks fast for that. <laughs> Baby, I'm a rapper, I ain't no trap. Hey, it'll tap. Then a nigga crack, you can clap that. Crack the silk, drop the drink, you can do something like that. Fuck the money up. Sorry. <laughs> Immer kommt irgendwoher ein Rapper gelaufen. In jedem Channel 5 Video ist irgendwo ein Dude, der dann reinkommt und irgendwie rein freestyle, Digga. Well, see, my man hot, he don't even rap, but <laughs> for the camera though, he was nice. Hey, that was fire. Yeah, it definitely was, man. So growing up here, what was it like, man? Hell. If I can describe one word, hell. In what sense? Niggas' moms dying, niggas dying for And to be honest, um, before the, you know, early 90s, this used to be a Caucasian neighborhood. Magst du das nochmal Zusammenhang erörtern? Um, Andrew Callaghan hat gerade gesagt, im Zusammenhang mit den YouTubern, dass es so ist, die haben eine, ein Businessmodell geschaffen, wo sie exzessiv von den katastrophalen Zuständen in Philadelphia profitieren. Und die haben sich selber eingeredet, dass es was Positives ist. Und der Zusammenhang ist der, ist, dass die Umstände, die durch diesen Tranquilizer-Kram in Fälle da hergestellt werden, eine ganze Reihe von YouTube-Kanälen gespawnt haben, die da hinfahren und Dokumentationen drehen. Und da gibt es reihenweise Videos, wenn ihr euch das selber mal anschaut. Ich weiß es aus, ich weiß es einfach, weil ich sie auch schon gesehen habe. Videos von F Leuten, die im Auto durch, die, äh, durch diese Straßen fahren und die Zustände zeigen. Videos von Leuten, die da durchgehen. Und das Ganze einfach kommentarlos filmen. Und das hat Hunderttausende, Millionen Views auf Basis, der, auf Basis dieses Phänomens von Katastrophentourismus. Und die Frage, die er gestellt hat, ist, wie bereichern die denn oder wie machen die das denn vor Ort besser? Denn die sind ja eigentlich sowas wie Parasiten, die da hinfahren, um sich an dem Content, der geboten wird, zu ergötzen. Und das ist schon ziemlich crazy. So habe ich das nicht gesehen. Aber der, Auf, der Vorwurf ist, dass die das auch oder dass die das ausnutzen, dass es so schlecht ist. Weniger um aufzuarbeiten, vielmehr um sich zu bereichern. Boah, war schon ziemlich krass. Und der Vergleich mit dem Dealer, der sich das dann schön redet und sagt, ja, aber wenn ich das nicht mache, macht es jemand anders, ist schon ziemlich wild. Puh. And there was my story. Yes, it was a Caucasian neighborhood. This was Kensington in 1982. You're probably asking yourself, what the hell happened? It's a long story, but let's get into it. As a Philadelphia native myself, who grew up in a neighborhood called Fairmount, just a 15 minute drive from Kensington, I've always been aware of the chaotic, corrupt, and confusing history of Philadelphia. And at some point while discussing the history of Kensington with locals, I realized that was the true story that needed coverage. It's obvious to the naked eye that Kensington is horrifying, but few ask the question, how did it get like this? Unlike San Francisco's Tenderloin, which is mainly a result of neglect and progressive policy, Kensington is a story of police corruption, deep-rooted segregation, and now is the face of a blatant scheme by property developers associated with Temple University, who've laid out a five-year plan to revitalize the Kensington Corridor. Six blocks down the street from the open-air drug market across Lehigh Avenue, developers have already began mass buyouts of property, Both residential and commercial. And Wisst ihr, was mir gerade einfällt? Sowas gibt es auch in Deutschland, Alter. Zu Silvester in Berlin. Es gibt ganze News-Channel, die Silvester durch Berlin fahren, um diesen apokalyptischen Zustand von diesen ganzen Böller-Ausländern, wie auch immer das gesagt wird, zu zeigen und dann ein Video draus zu machen, das dann geklickt wird. Holy Sch Alter. Ob man nun auf, mit dem Motorrad durch Berlin fährt oder ob man nun einfach mit dem Auto durchfährt oder einfach äh, einen Zusammenschnitt von kommentarlosen, von kommentarlosen Clips macht. Das ist einfach the same shit. The same shit. The police, in turn, are helping them to displace homeless people and push them further up the street toward the open-air drug market. With this in mind, it's quite obvious that the city is allowing the open-air drug market to flourish in order to lower property values and drive out local residents and businesses. That way, they can buy it up at a low cost, then begin enforcing drug laws, push addicts further. Inwiefern ist Böllern beobachten dasselbe wie Elend für sich monetär nutzen? Du hast es nicht verstanden. Ich versuche es nochmal klar zu machen. Das, was gemacht wird, ist nicht Böllern beobachten. Das, was gemacht wird, ist einen Kriegszustandsähnliches, ein Kriegszustandsähnliches Szenario herbeidokumentieren. Denn das ist das, was in Berlin 
getan wurde. Die Berichterstattung konzentrieren sich darauf, oh, das kann ja wohl nicht sein. Ich, ich weiß nicht, ob du die Sch*** mal angeguckt hast, aber ich habe mir die Sch*** angeguckt und das nur von den Agenturen, die das auch noch kommentieren, aber die, Kom die Dokumentation ist nicht, Leute gucken beim Böllern zu, sondern Leute dokumentieren die apokalyptischen Zustände in Berlin, weil die Ausländer es mal wieder randalieren. Das ist es. Und weil sich das letztes Jahr so exzessiv in den Medien niedergelassen hat, war es dieses Jahr auch sofort wieder da. Away and turn Kensington into a full-blown gentrified corridor, complete with juice bars, yoga studios and so forth. Sounds crazy, but as you'll learn, for Philadelphia, this is regular. Let's go back to the year 1900. Back then, Philadelphia was a cesspool of rough and tumble European immigrants from countries like Ireland, Italy, Germany, and beyond. At this time, Philadelphia was 94.5% white and 72% foreign born. Imagine that. One of these immigrants was my great great grandfather, Jeremiah Callahan, a poor Irish Catholic farm boy from Cork, Ireland. After the potato famine, Jeremiah hatched a plan to catch a boat to the New World and ended up settling in West Philadelphia in a row home with seven children and one bathroom. Despite overcrowding, Philadelphia became known as the paradise of the skilled worker. Wages were high and Philadelphia emerged as the center of manufacturing for many industries. But most notably, Kensington was the center of the textile industry. Weißt du, was damals cool war? Hüte. Hüte waren voll cool. Brunner, ne? Hüte. The Beatty Factory, which employed over... Alle über mit, über, alle über mit coolen Hüten unterwegs, Digga. 100,000 people in 1915. But after World War I... Also nicht diese Hüte. <lacht> uh, ganz, schlechter, ganz schlechter Zusammenhang gerade. Also nicht solche Hüte. Kicked off and the Great Depression followed in 1928. Philadelphia experienced... Oh, oh, oh mein Gott. Nicht solche Hüte. It's called deindustrialization. As factories shut down and for whatever reason, the textile industry moved to the American South. By 1935, Philadelphia lost two-thirds of all manufacturing jobs, leading to mass unemployment and significant urban decay. Many of these European immigrants, who believed that America would be paradise, found themselves jobless and pissed off. Now, simultaneously, six million African Americans were leaving the South, heading north to cities like Chicago, Detroit, and of course, Philadelphia. Philadelphia. This was called the Great Migration. This migration drastically changed the demographics of Philadelphia. Now, it's important to remember that before this, 91% of African Americans lived in the South. And while slavery was technically abolished in 1865 after the collapse of the Confederacy, the following decades proved to be no less difficult for Southern Blacks. The white, formerly slaveholding majority in the South fought viciously against Black integration during the Reconstruction era. They formed organizations like the Ku Klux Klan, a vigilante group of terrorists whose foundational goal was to prevent black Americans from voting or achieving political power. And almost all of the initial KKK members were former Confederate soldiers. And in just two decades, they assassinated hundreds of politicians and lynched 4,600 civilians. Sharecropping also was running rampant. And Jim Crow laws were militantly enforced by the police, Klan, and just ordinary white citizens. Boah. Ey, wenn ich nicht schon so viel mit Europa zu tun hätte, ne? Und ich nur am Rande mitbekomme, wie die Geschichte rund um die, beispielsweise die gesamte Geschichte der, der Polizei Amerikas in Verbindung mit tief verankertem Rassismus ist, Bruder, dann würde ich mich darum auch noch, da würde ich mich darum, darüber auch noch mehr informieren und dann mehr darüber reden, aber es ist so viel, Alter. Das ist so crazy. Es gibt einen sehr informativen Kanal einer Amerikanerin, die Anwältin ist, die das sehr gut macht. Mir fällt der Name gerade nicht ein, die diese, diese Aufklärung betreibt. Das ist sehr, sehr crazy. Wenn es mir einfällt, verlinke ich das mal. Anyways, Black Southerners had a million reasons. Irgendwas mit Lia oder so, ja, irgendwas. Lia Miller? Reasons to leave the South. So, they did. However, when they arrived to Philadelphia, they were not in paradise. They found themselves in a very different, but still quite hostile environment which makes sense given the fact that they immigrated in the midst of an economic decline and were seen as a threat to job security. In 1939, World War II begins, just as black population in Philadelphia hits 11%. Millions of men, both black and white, go to war. 
Then, in 1945, the war ends and all the troops come home. President Roosevelt signs something into law called the GI Bill, aka the Servicemen's Readjustment Act, which provides a wide range of benefits for returning veterans. Most importantly, the GI Bill provided low-cost mortgages and generous financial aid that made it possible for almost every returning veteran to afford a nice, new family home. And so, the idea for suburbia was hatched. It's important to remember that at this point in 1944, suburbia as we know it today did not exist. There was no cul-de-sacs, strip malls, or sprawling subdivisions surrounding every... Genau, Lia Miller haben wir gerade gesagt. Also wenn ihr, was das angeht, ein bisschen, euch noch ein bisschen mehr informieren wollt, Lia Miller macht sehr krasse Videos zu diesen Themen. Da geht es um beispielsweise den Hintergrund der, den rassistischen Hintergrund der Polizei und wieso und warum. Ist sehr krass, sehr, sehr krass major U.S. city. There was only really two types of areas, urban and rural centers. And as we know, the urban centers were in very bad shape. So a real estate developer named William J. Levitt and his company, Levitt & Sons, had an idea. Use the military method to mass produce homes on old farmland. That way, he can create new communities overnight. The mass construction of low-cost, low-density residential developments in the rural area... Hold on. Es gibt einen Horrorfilm in dem ein Paar in so eine Gegend fährt und nie wieder rauskommt und die immer an diesem komischen gleichen Haus sind. Ich weiß nicht, wie der Horrorfilm heißt. Areas surrounding the cities, particularly Philadelphia, New York and Boston. These were called Levittowns and were built very quickly to accommodate veterans returning home from World War II, which was nearly half of all American males. In fact, Levitt and Sons worked directly with the Veterans Administration to subsidize these mortgage payments. Within the first week, 67,000 veterans, both black and Vivarium heißt er. Könnt ihr euch auch mal angucken. Erinnert mich gerade daran. In white, applied to live in Levittowns. This is Levittown, Pennsylvania, a new suburban community of 60,000 people, midway between Philadelphia and Trenton, New Jersey. Yet, 99% of black applicants were denied. Why? It seems pretty unconstitutional, especially given the fact that Levittowns were partnered directly with the VA, but there was nothing the VA could do. Here was the typical experience of a black veteran attempting to apply for a home in Levittown. I walked up to the uh, salesperson and I said to him, we're very interested in your house and we'd like an application. And I remember what he said to me, he looked at me, he said, it's not me, but the management has not as yet decided whether he's going to sell these houses to Negroes or not. The man management he's referring to was the HOLC, or the Homeowners Loan Corporation, who had a plan to dramatically segregate Philadelphia through a practice known as redlining. Now, the HOLC made it imperative that these newly built suburbs in Levittowns were to be whites only. New middle class families of Levittown had one other thing in common. They were all white. And we understood that it was going to be all white and we were very happy to buy a home here. Bruder, die Vergangenheit ist wirklich, also die Vergangenheit in good old Germany ist wirklich, hmm. Und die Vergangenheit in Amerika ist wirklich auch, hmm, hmm, In fact, they carved out the entire metro area to confine, <lacht> wirklich, wirklich, hmm, hmm, black people to the north, inner west and southeast of the city, which were the most neglected parts of Philadelphia. And so, white suburbia was born. My great-grandparents picked up and left West Philadelphia in the early 1950s and never returned back to the big city, as did 150,000 other white Philadelphians over the course of the next two decades. Between 1945 and 1970, Philadelphia's white population decreased from 87% to 62%. This mass migration was known as white flight. In an ideal world, it would have just been called flight, but the HOLC's dramatic racial restrictions made this impossible. Anyways, by 1970, Philadelphia was the most predominantly black city on the East Coast and fell into deep poverty as the suburbs expanded. But Kensington, in this context, was a true anomaly because it was one of the few non-segregated neighborhoods in Philadelphia. So the HOLC, who wrote the blueprint for redlining and segregation, designated Kensington in 1945 as a concentration of undesirables, including low-class whites and Negroes. Kensington whites really didn't leave until the 1990s. And throughout the 1970s and 1980s, Kensington was the center of the Irish-American criminal underworld, specifically a gang called the K&A Gang, a group of Irish burglars and methamphetamine traffickers who decided to set up shop on the corner of Kensington and Allegheny. Does that ring a bell? It's the street corner where we filmed the first half of this video. For several decades, this corner flourished as an Irish-controlled meth market. And even back then, police looked the other way. But in the late 80s, 
crack cocaine was introduced to the inner city. This form of cocaine comes concentrated. It is smoked rather than sniffed. It produces an intense high within five to 10 seconds that lasts only five to 10 minutes. Leading to a spike in homicides and open air gang warfare that ravaged Philadelphia. As a result, Philadelphia experienced a second white flight. Between 1990 and 2010, white population in Philadelphia decreased from 57% down to 33% of the city. And for the first time, suburban population actually exceeded urban population in Philadelphia. The Kensington whites, including the K&A gang, were among those whites who left the city in the 90s. This left their open-air drug market pretty much unattended. So crack and heroin traffickers, who were mainly black and Latino, decided to set up shop on the corner once used and occupied by the Irish. When the 90s hit, a lot of Hispanics and Blacks moved into the neighborhood. Krass, was das alles für zusammenhängende Auswirkungen hat, ne? Also diese Siedlungspolitik, der darin verankerte Rassismus, das ähm, gesellschaftliche Umverteilen, ist voll crazy. That's when the drug trafficking got real heavy. Did a lot of the Hispanics and Blacks who moved here, were they coming from other parts of Philly or were they migrating from different states and cities? Uh, other parts of Philadelphia. It ain't, it ain't, too, it ain't too many outsiders over here. Shockingly, Philadelphia police continued their look-the-other-way policy, but locals say that was only for the sale of drugs, not public consumption. What you see today has only been allowed for the past few years. When I was young, they used to get high in abandoned houses. They used to hide. They used to hide from people to do this. They did. They used to keep them more concealed. They used to be more, more, you know what I'm saying? But you know what they told me though? When I told them, like, what is y'all doing? Go in the abandoned houses and get high. Why y'all doing this shit out here? You know what they told me? They said, if I go in the abandoned houses and get high and I, and I OD, ain't nobody gonna find me. So they really feel comfortable getting high outside. So because when they OD, somebody walk past, somebody see them and they give them CPR. And I have gave them CPR plenty of times and gave them Narcan plenty of times. But like back in the day, like I said, they used to go in the abandoned houses. They used to hide from this. This always been a problem. It's just now it's outside for everybody to see now. So in terms of legality, is it legal to use and sell drugs in this particular radius? If you don't get locked up, what you call it? Say if a cop walk past you, right, and you getting high you're outside, getting high, right? and you don't get locked up, and you get no citations, no nothing, what you call it? It's call it. Legal. legal, almost. Yeah. Damn near. Legal. Damn near. But what about actually selling drugs? That's still illegal, right? Uh, it's, yeah, it's definitely still illegal. You definitely can't sell drugs. Definitely can't sell drugs, yeah. This is a very important distinction to make. While in recent years, Philadelphia police have turned an extreme blind eye to public drug consumption in Kensington, the same does not apply to drug dealing, like it once did during the days of the Irish mob. A major drug bust in Kensington. This morning, Philadelphia District Attorney Larry Krasner announced the arrest of more than 57 suspects for allegedly selling fentanyl, heroin, cocaine, and other drugs. Many locals feel like this sort of selective enforcement is essentially entrapment. That's how they that now. That's how they get black. You know, that's how they get us. They give it to us. Yeah. What do you mean they give it to you? The government bring it into the United States for us to sell. The they don't tax it, so they lock us up for it. If the government could tax it, they, we wouldn't go to jail for it. All right. So this time I want to do a side note. All right. Let me do a side note. Side note. My goal is to have a dog show in Philadelphia. So for everybody watching this, my Instagram is BillyLoveKennel underscore twenty seven. I breed dogs for a living. I do it for a hobby. If any. Uh. I want a free dog. They not they they expensive, but there are some dogs that I will bless some families with. You just gotta give me a good enough reason why you need it for free. Do you feel like Michael Vick gave dog owners in Philly a bad reputation? Yes, he did. Shit, what you talking about? Hell yeah, he did. But you know, he came back from here, apologized. Yeah, he's, yeah. He's a yeah. professional yeah. responsible people. Yeah. I know yeah. with yeah. his dog. So yes, yeah. yeah. I breed dogs. I do not fight. I do not yeah. fight dogs. Yeah. Michael Vick does have a fascinating story of redemption and rebirth. But anyways, that's a story for a different day. As I mentioned earlier, K&A is on the frontier of an ongoing class war, which right now has an obvious dividing line, Lehigh Avenue. Lehigh, right there with a the bridge at. Let me take you on a brief drive here from the open air drug market six blocks south to give you an idea of just how dramatic a contrast there is. We begin our drive on the corner of K&A at the gates of hell and drive south on Kensington Avenue. As we saw, there are thousands of people here shooting up and smoking trank, fentanyl, meth, and heroin. Almost every business, aside from a select few, is permanently closed. Oh my god, Alter, ist das krass. As you continue to drive a few blocks, there's still decay. Adult video stores, cops standing around, strange pedestrians staring at you, ice cream trucks driving around looking for opiate addicts on the come down, and more abandoned commercial property. You finally approach the bridge, which marks Lehigh Avenue. As soon as you cross, almost every property is for sale or undergoing active construction. 
We're told this entire neighborhood has been torn down in the past five years. After developers staged a complete bulldoze of South Kensington to make room for new luxury apartment buildings and artisan commercial storefronts. What the fuck? Wie weit die sind jetzt drei Minuten gefahren? As you continue to drive a few blocks, there's still decay. Adult video stores, cops standing around, strange pedestrians staring at you, ice cream trucks driving around looking for opiate addicts on the come down, and more abandoned commercial property. You finally approach the bridge, which marks Lehigh Avenue. As soon as you cross, almost every property is for sale or undergoing active construction. We're told this entire neighborhood has been torn down in the past five years. After developers staged a complete bulldoze of South Kensington to make room for new luxury apartment buildings and artisan commercial storefronts. Aside from the loud construction noise, things are pretty chill here. There are no drug addicts or police in sight. You begin to spot well-off white people, like myself. You see dyed hair and cold brew, Ukraine flag, <laughs> oh, good. and BLM-related art. People are in the streets actively revitalizing. Do you know what this used to be? A factory. A factory? Yeah. You see Amazon delivery boxes, Porsches with New Jersey plates, and people that you can almost guarantee are not from North Philadelphia. No disrespect. It's like stepping into a different world. You almost can't believe that the corner of Cain. Holy sh**, Alter. Das ist ja Gentrifizierung auf dreifacher Geschwindigkeit und du gehst kurz auf Toilette und dann kommt deine Stadt zurück und auf einmal ist das da. What the f a is just 10 blocks away from here. But you're quickly reminded when you see an advertisement for the abode at Oxford in Kensington, a newly built luxury apartment building. Oh, I guess nobody actually lives here yet. This whole shit's like an empty construction site. <clears throat> yeah, nobody lives here yet. If you walk around this neighborhood, which I, which I guess is like the north central Philadelphia area, like straight up, every single street has probably two to three active construction sites. Die Tatsache? Dass die, also als Europäer zu sehen, wie die da Häuser bauen, ist immer ein bisschen surreal. Das da ist die Fassade von außen, anscheinend. Da wird noch so eine Platte drüber gelegt oder so eine, da wird noch so eine, so eine Verkleidung drüber gemacht, damit das nicht nass wird. Und du denkst dir so, Bruder, wenn der große böse Wolf kommt und hustet und prustet und hustet und pustet, dann ist das Haus aber weg. <lacht> dann ist das aber einfach weg. Also... Amerika hat sich kollektiv einfach dazu entschlossen zu sagen, wir wissen, die Scheiße geht kaputt, aber wir bauen sie so besser, schneller wieder auf. So, es ist wirklich, es ist wirklich, wirklich vollkommen wild. And they're all building shit, like those apartments right there, which kind of have like a Philly row home vibe, but if, as you can see, like they all have the exact same, uh, like house number font. The abode at Oxford in Kensington, which offers a 10-year tax abatement. I don't know what fucking type of Ponzi scheme is happening here, but moving somewhere for a phase two tax abatement in North Philly, it's kind of weird, but it looks kind of nice. I've seen a lot of things, but this dramatic contrast between Kensington North and Kensington South was something I've never seen in my life. It was as if Lehigh Avenue was an imaginary force field that blocked all the problems of North Kensington from seeping into the South. But according to locals, the south part of Kensington, going all the way down to Fishtown, which now is the center of gentrification in Philadelphia, used to more or less resemble K&A just a decade ago. That means they drücken die immer weiter nach außen, oder? Your golfing station. Yeah. It used to be just like this. Yes, they pushed it They're down. They're gentrifying too. us because all the Caucasians used to live all the way out the boulevards. And now they want to go back. Yeah, and have to commute to downtown. Yeah, and this is now they want to ride yeah. their bicycles. Or they want to hop on the L without getting. wollen wieder rein. Die Weißen wollen wieder in die Städten. Was? Da wohnt jetzt die Schwarzen? <laughs> das müssen wir anderen. Bruder. Bam, bam, bam. Now, so. if you go down Dolphin, I got shot 15 times. Bruder. Oh, this was eight years ago. You go down there, those houses back then were worth 15,000. They're worth 700,000 right now. Yeah. They know what they're doing. So what they're doing is they're letting all the addicts be out here so the homeowners sell and get the hell out of here. And next thing you know what happens. All the contractors swoop in, buy that shit at the low and sell it at the top. Yes, sir. And who gonna buy at the top? There ain't too many blacks and colors that's really like really spending millions and hundreds of thousands on their properties and stuff like that. We're not stupid. I got a college degree. He got a college degree. Like, yeah. But, but it's the color of our skin. No disrespect. It's the color of our skin that... They make the case that the city of Philadelphia is essentially playing inside baseball with developers and contractors by allowing K&A to flourish in its current form. 
That way, property values will dramatically decrease, allowing for a full-scale revitalization at a much lower cost. This may What the f***? Alter, ist das... What? Die lassen das bewusst verwahrlosen, damit die Immobilienpreise sinken, dann kaufen sie es auf, renovieren es und vertreiben es um, um für einen deutlich größeren... Pro what? Oh mein Gott, what the f***? Das ist ganz schön crazy. Endstufenkapitalismus ist das, glaube ich. Das ist Kapitalismus auf Endstufe. Sound like a conspiracy theory, but consider that a year ago, Philadelphia simultaneously evacuated its two largest underground homeless encampments, forcing homeless people above ground and sending them directly to the corner of KA. And officials today cleared out several homeless encampments in that neighborhood. It was all part of an effort to tackle the city's growing opioid crisis. One of these encampments was called Conrail which ran along the train tracks in South Kensington for multiple decades. I don't know if you're familiar with Gurney Street, Conrail. Um, growing up, I just remember people living um, where Conrail is. Well, it's a train track that is like their city. They yeah. come up here, they buy their drugs, they'll go back into the train tracks. So you're so clean up here. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, like yeah. when I say they had a city down there, they probably had 100,000 people down there. Yeah. And then next thing you know, now they're up on the surface, like, you know, with everyone else and with nowhere to go. Now it's our turn. And then the the, the F the part is right. The, the it's a law where a guy can have ten bundles of dope in front of the cops shooting up. Mm -hmm. Nothing nothing's done to them. Nothing said to them. Yeah. But let another person sell one bag of weed in front of him. He's locked the fuck up. What you what you going in his pocket for? What you going in his pocket for? Because he's sleeping. I'm about to leave. But why you going why you going in his pocket though? She's trying to steal from him. No, he's okay. He's okay. Nobody know. Nobody know but you. Nobody know but you. It's okay. He's okay. How do you know? First off, he's asking why you going in her pocket. She's having a million and one excuses. You know what I'm oh, it's because he's he's not going to get robbed. Just leave him alone. He's alright. You about to rob him? Be careful, Frank. Be careful, Frank. All right, Frank. Make sure you got everything in your pocket, Frank. All right. I know you don't give a fuck, Frank, but we care. She's going in your pocket. Come on. Whether it's true or not that KNA is just a product of one big development scheme is to be determined. However, one thing is for sure. Philadelphia is gentrifying at a more rapid pace than almost anywhere else in America right now. Vollkommen irre. Also wirklich vollkommen irre. Die schieben die Obdachlosen und Drogenabhängigen mit Bulldozern vor sich her. And obviously, while it's better to live next to a yoga studio than it is to an open-air trank market, simply revitalizing one area and just pushing the problem further away yeah. doesn't actually solve anything. It's krass. It's really krass. It's only a temporary band-aid for problems like drugs and crime, which are endemic in our society. Eventually, like we see in San Francisco, the criminal element of every city which is only repressed by gentrification will grow to reclaim the city it was pushed out of. This kind of rapid development has proved to be totally unsustainable and results in the emboldening of a hyper-localized criminal underclass who spends their entire free time preying on transplants. In a recent episode, we covered a burglar named Jack the Bipper in San Francisco. Here is how he justifies his motivation for stealing. Th this shit... Honestly, it became a forte of mine because the Google techies that started coming by, they were so fucking dumb, so stupid. They'd pull up in their fucking new Tesla, jump out the car, doors fucking wide, like, fucking left open with hella shit in there, dude. Yeah. Greed can only hit you so much, dude. And it's also, it's like, dude, I feel like it was more so, we had to teach some guys a lesson, you know? It's like, come on, dude. You're just gonna leave all your shit there every day, every week, like no matter what. I'm talking about like when they go to work, like yeah. you know they'll leave the doors unlocked no matter what. Like die Folge haben wir gesehen, die ist sehr gut. As you can see, much of his desire to do crime is a reaction to San Francisco's gentrification, which rapidly disrupted the economy and cultural identity of the city. Ja, die San Francisco Folge, äh, San Francisco Folge ist übrigens, ich glaube, wird fast sagen, das ist meine Lieblung, Lieblings Channel 5 Folge weil die so viel abdeckt und San Francisco einfach auch so ein Stoll ist. Cultural capital actually matters. And Kensington is home to many local artists who aren't homeless and don't approve of what the city has allowed their neighborhood to turn into. This is my homie right here, Big Banks Kenzo. He been holding Kensington down for a long time. I touch a bang for real. Best of low stash, that boy gonna be mad. That shit gonna be bad for real. Hey bro, chill out, you already know no we carry no pussy. I used to tuck all the work in my sock. Still on the F, I can't go to the spot. Bitch in the face of my hood, if you with me, you good, baby. Y'all got this shit in real life. He says that since cops began turning a blind eye oh. in Kensington, it's become a magnet for drug users all around the country. 
Some people come down here. I talked to this one boy. He said he was from Memphis. He came down here eight years ago and got stuck and just been comfortable down here. How you do that? I, I make clothes like bro said. I give clothes out to these people for free. I gave one guy clothes. He found my Instagram when he moved to California, got on his feet. He got his life together. And then I just found out he OD'd out there all fitting off. And it's like, damn, you left down here to get on your feet and you still went to wherever you went to thinking you found peace and still got caught up in there. So this is really a mindset. It don't matter where you at, bro. Some of these people really have mental problems, schizophrenia. Like they be having serious issues going on with them, something that we can't help them. Like, But then it's like, if they know they could come here and not do it elsewhere, it makes hair even worse. You gotta remember, there's little kids down here just like it is out Fairmount in yeah. Seattle and all that. Bro, that's walking yeah. to school, they got walk passes. We just were talking about the library. I got a 10 year old son, he know that the library is called Needles Park. He never knew it as the library, I knew it as. And I just moved out the neighborhood. So yeah, hell yeah. I ain't gonna lie, bro, I done, I done moved out the neighborhood. If the real estate conspiracy is true, the plan is working. Big Banks Kenzo, a member of the creative class whose entire identity is based around the neighborhood, is leaving after 27 years, out of concerns for the safety of his son. Developers mm. obviously don't mm. care, but tearing down old school neighborhoods to build homogenized hipster zones like you see in Williamsburg, Brooklyn, or Silver Lake, Los Angeles, is a very short-sighted decision because it ultimately erases the culture and history of the neighborhood, which are the very factors that made it attractive to transplants in the first place. Yet, this is all justified in the name of safety, a strange and politicized term that leads to many questions. Safety from who? And safety from what? Who is the unsafe person? And who are we keeping them away from? Does this mean keeping drug addicts away from children? What about the 10,000 children living in Kensington? Or does it mean keeping gang members away from grandmothers? Which is impossible because they typically live together. In my opinion, what safety means in this context, without question, is keeping Temple University students away from Philadelphia locals. Let me explain. Temple University is a predominantly white, relatively expensive university in the middle of North Philly. When I say the middle, it's in the middle of North Philly. It's only about three miles from K&A, mm -hmm. and for many decades, Temple has had a reputation as a very dangerous place to go to school. Two students were robbed on 16th Street, both inside of Temple's patrol zone. However, in the past decade, Temple has gone above and beyond to rehabilitate Hogwarts. its image and increase enrollment, and it's definitely worked. They've expanded their police force to include safety initiatives, like the walking escort program and expanded their patrol boundaries to include a 50 block radius that just barely borders the Kensington neighborhood to the east. Warte mal. Erzählt er mir gerade davon, dass die einen privaten Warte mal, haben die eine private Sicherheitsforce oder was erzählt er mir gerade? Now, this Temple patrol boundary has gradually expanded as Temple University has systematically purchased blocks upon blocks of North Philadelphia row homes to convert into student houses. To clarify, Temple hasn't done this directly, but through their shell companies, Temple Nest Apartments, Temple Villas, and Temple Town Realty. It should come as no surprise that many of the properties in South Kensington past Lehigh Avenue are being developed specifically by these companies. I know this might sound crazy, but hear me out. I think that Temple University President Jason Wingard, Philadelphia Mayor Jim Kenney, Police Chief Kevin Bethel, and the Trank brothers are all partners in a four-way real estate scam to build an Equinox gym and Stumptown coffee roasters on the corner of Kensington and Allegheny in five years. I'm obviously joking, but the point I'm making is that speculating over who's doing what and why this is happening is kind of what the f futile at this point. There's no real possible way to actually resist gentrification, and no amount of awareness in the world could possibly disrupt these market forces. The reality is that everyday life for people doing drugs on the corner of K&A is absolute hell. But there's one perspective we haven't heard from, the female perspective. Women make up less than 28% of homeless people, but their experience on the streets is oftentimes even more rough than it is for males. What you're about to see is an interview with two homeless women who are currently living on the streets of Kensington. I should warn you before proceeding, many of the subjects discussed in this interview involved childhood sexual abuse and may be very disturbing to some viewers. Um, I Trigger warning, bros! I'm Jessica, I've been out here for 10, 10 years, 12 years. That's a long time. Yeah. Is that so an opium, uh, so opium lutcher? 
oder ist das einfach nur ein klassischer Lutscher und ich interpretiere in alles Opiumlutscher rein, Digga? Uh, my name's Melissa. I've been out here on and off for the past three years. Um, I was living out of my car when I got evicted from my apartment. Now I'm officially on the street because cops took my car a month ago. I lost my full-time job. I was a functioning addict, so I was still working full-time. Um, when I lost my job uh, during COVID, it kind of pushed me back with all my rent and bills. What, what was the job you had prior to COVID? Um, I'm a medical biller. I'm certified. Okay. We were working from home for a while, and then they kind of did the layoffs um, yeah. about seven, eight months home. That's part why I relapsed, too. I had four years clean, and yeah. during COVID, I was just having a lot of things coming at me all at once, yeah. and that's how I relapsed. And plus, me being stuck in and not being able to go anywhere to keep busy. I, don't, yeah. I like to keep busy to keep me sober. And I wasn't able to do that because everything was shut down. So that's part of the reason why I relapsed. So where do you sleep now? Wherever I can find it safe, where I'm not going to get robbed or, <laughs> you know, a lot of people are going to come at me. So um, usually I try to park that are close by. Um, they're usually pretty safe at night. Right. So. so um, but yeah, anywhere around here I could find. Are there any particular challenges you guys feel like you face out here as women? Uh, yeah, Absolutely. definitely. We're definitely uh, targeted <laughs> over men um, as far as robberies, um, sexual assaults. I had, um, it was like two in the morning and this car kept driving by and there were two people in it and there were, and I was walking and, and there was no one around and the one got out and tried to pull me in and luckily a car that was passing got out and said, I got your place if you don't let her go. Yeah. But I mean, there have been times where that hasn't happened, and you know what I mean? I, it is what it is. It, I would like to get clean. I've been getting high, I mean, since 11. 11 years old? Yeah. How um, did you first get introduced to drugs? Um, my mom. My mom. What drug did she first introduce you to? Uh, Klodopins when I was 11. So pharmaceuticals is where it began for you. Yeah, um, but she smoked crack. I never smoked crack. And then when I was 15, she got clean off crack and uh, developed a dope habit. <laughs> and we was getting high one day, and I thought she nodded off, and she wound up dying. So she died when I was 16. Damn, you were there? Yeah, I was with her. I thought she just nodded off. I mean, like, it hurt me, but my mom did a lot of fucked up shit yeah. to me, you know. Was She, your dad in the picture? Uh, no, not really. After my mom left him for a drug dealer, he just, you know. And then she was with him for, like, two years. He caught a case and went to jail, and he didn't snitch. So, like, the guy he was getting quantity off of, the guy he was getting quantity off of had a thing for little girls. So instead of my mom tricking him, she would send him to my room. And it started when I was nine, and from nine to 11, um, she would, you know, pimp me out to him. I didn't find that out till I was 15, that she was pimping me out to him. That's fucking horrible, I'm sorry to hear that. Like, and then, and then, and then, like, she wanted the pity, like, Oh, well, Jess, how do you think I felt? Like, I would hear my daughter screaming in pain, and my high would get fucked up. And DHS got involved, but they didn't do shit. Like, I went to the hospital, and they examined me, and they were like, she's got scar tissue damage down there. She's got, like, and DHS never followed up or nothing, and I had to stay there. So, but when she died, it still hurt. Like, that's still my mom. When your mom passed away, was that kind of a wake-up call for you, where you feel like you wanted to get clean? Yeah, I did get clean. I moved to Jer I moved to um, Jersey for a little bit, but um, then I just came back to Philly, and then uh, I just couldn't just couldn't like handle it. You know what I mean? And one thing you mentioned is that you started doing Klonopin when, when you were 11 years old. How many people out here do you think like began their spiral into addiction via pharmaceutical drugs? Oh, everybody, because, um... I would say, like, 90%. Yeah. 90% yeah. at least. Because after she died, I stayed away from the heroin, and then when I was, like, 19, I started doing perks, which yeah. led to oxys, which led to... Right. And I, I was working... I was an office manager at an MRI office, so, like, I had a job in an apartment, and then I left that job to work for the city, and, you know, it, it was just... 
Is, it was just all too much to handle That's after. How I actually um, got introduced with opiates and heroin because I was in pain management. I was in a really bad car accident. Right. So I was in pain management on the pain medication, Oxy. And then when the DEA started tightening up the rules, having doctors cut the medication, um, I got cut off it and I couldn't afford buying the pills off the street. It was just way too expensive. But physical symptoms, it's hard to just stop. And um, the heroin and dope was cheaper. Yes. So that's how I got it. And I didn't even get introduced to that until my 30s. I was shocked. It seemed that from coast to coast, the vast majority of homeless addicts that I talked to began their spiral downward as a result of being prescribed opiates by a doctor after sustaining a serious personal injury. Gradually, their tolerance to prescribed drugs like Oxycontin and Percocet would build. This would lead to financial hardship, which would in turn prompt them to turn to stronger and cheaper street opiates. Oder die Opiumkrise in den Staaten? Du kannst nichts fabrizieren, nicht in deinen wildesten Fantasien, wenn man das alles sieht und das alles mitbekommt, kannst du nichts Fantasi heraufbeschwören, das dem Ganzen auch nur im entferntesten Close gegenübersteht. Das ist einfach vollkommen apokalyptisch. So stelle ich mir die Apokalypse vor. Und so wird sie auch so wird sie auch dargestellt, wenn man mal so apokalyptische Filme so ein bisschen aus den, aus den Anfang der 2000er sieht. So alles, was in Robocop dargestellt wird, wie die Zukunft sein soll. Das ist f das fehlt nur noch Robocop. Like fentanyl, heroin and trank. It's clear that without question our society has completely So Judge Dredd A Judge Dredd, Robocop, so das ist dieses, das ist das, was hier passiert. Failed these people. It's almost incomprehensible that our government is using our tax dollars to send billions to military aid to fight proxy wars in countries like Ukraine and Israel, while major American cities like Philadelphia, Los Angeles, Portland, Seattle and beyond host actual portals of death like KNA. Boah, ist das hot. No matter where you stand on the political spectrum, it's clear that something needs to be done immediately. And no one feels this way more than the drug users who are living in this hell. Out here, do you think that this is a good thing that the city is allowing this? Absolutely not. No, I think it's awful that the city allows it, that the cops just sit there and the the, some of the insane things I've seen out here, you can't make it up. And Like what? <laughs> it, it just a lot of craziness that happens with Cops the people make you do dates for free and they say if Some you don't do. yeah, yeah if you don't you'll, you'll get arrested like so they want sexual favors or they'll arrest you even though you committed no crime i was i used to live at front and perks and i went down to front and cecil b more to sell my stamps and i bought some food and i'm walking home and this cop circled me like two or three times and i had grocery bags And by the time I got to Cecil B. Moore, he was parked there. He left my groceries, and he's like, if you don't give me a price, I'm putting you in handcuffs. I'm like, I'm not retarded. I ain't giving you a price. That's, like, incriminating myself. So he put me in cuffs, put me in the back. I'm like, where's the fucking body cam? Like, where? But this was, like, six, seven years ago. Like, where's the body cam? Where's the fucking car cam? And he got in the back seat. We parked him where he got in the back seat. And then... And then he left me there. And then and then he would have the balls when he would pass me to be like, Oh, are you good? Are you all right? You need you know, is anybody bothering you? Yeah, you. That's what I mean. You, That's you're bothering me. Funny. Yeah, like you're bothering me. Like you just made me fucking I've heard similar um, stories. Like, none of that's ever happened to me personally, but I've heard similar stories from other people, um, other females down here. Um, but I just think it's terrible. Something does need to be done. I, I, people down here need help. They don't need to be treated like trash yeah, and not like shit. somebody's brother, sister, mother, right. daughter. They're somebody's family member, and it's just terrible how people are treated. Yeah. There's even cops that... There's a, my ex, his... his um, Godfather is a, was a cop, and he used to take the dope off the dealers and bring it home to him. You know what I mean? Like the the, the cops out here like ain't no good. Like they'll watch it's you. A lot of corruption. Yeah, it's like a lot of corruption. Yeah. You know. I mean, a lot of people would say that these kind of zones are necessary because if you don't con contain the problem, it'll it'll spread like wildfire to the rest of the city. Do you guys agree with that narrative? I I understand. Um, Their thought process in that I, I, I understand that but at the same time 
people need legitimate help down here, not just throwing Narcan or, or hopefully yeah, like, you know, jail, like, like, yeah, like, or putting people in jail, things like that. Like the way they're taking the approach to offer assistance and help, it, it's just not working. Yeah, they need to come up with a better in, plan. Is that an ice cream truck? Huh? Yes. Wahrscheinlich von den ganzen drogenabhängigen Munchies, die die bekommen, oder? Yes, uh, so the addicts, let me ask you a question. Why is the ice cream popularized in the addict community? Like a lot of addicts buy a lot of ice cream. I always love ice cream. See, and when I that's your excuse. My daughters, but you know, I no, eat all y'all buys it. I love yeah, ice cream addicts, anyway. Addicts, we all Especially when we're coming, when we're coming off of it. Yeah. Sweets. Um, That's right. Like sweet and ice cream is the best option, especially. Oder der Eiswagen, das ist ja wie ein Horrorfilm. Stell mal vor, du gehst durch die Straße, es wird ein bisschen dunkler, überall die sind die Drogenabhängigen, die an den Seiten sitzen und am Ende der Straße ist einfach so ein Eiswagen, der so langsam von links nach rechts über die Straße creept so und die Musik spielt so, oh Bruder, ich krieg direkt Pennywise, Pennywise Fears. Alter Schwede, ist das crazy. Do you, guys, do you guys want to get some ice cream right now? I would love some ice cream. Ah, this is the horror, Der schiefe Ton macht es auch schlimm, Alter. Okay. Digga, der Ton macht mich irre, Digga. Say, kannst du bei so viel schwerer Kost an Content nachts überhaupt schlafen? Mir fällt das nach deinen Streams teilweise echt schwer. Gar nicht, ich habe überhaupt keine Probleme. Aber ich bin... Äh, ich ich glaube, dass ich da auch nicht der durchschnittliche Konsument bin. Ich empfehle auch jedem, falls er, also jedem, dir inklusive, ich empfehle jedem, dass er, wenn er merkt, dass einem das irgendwie zu nahe geht, dass ich einfach verpissen soll. Also einfach, einfach ausmachen und verschwinden und auch den Stream nicht gucken. So, das ist, das muss man irgendwie auch mit sich selber ausmachen. Aber bei mir kommt das nicht an. Also alles hier hat in keiner Art und Weise Auswirkungen auf meinen, auf meinen Wirklich auf meine mentale Gesundheit, gar nicht. Vielleicht zu abgehärtet, vielleicht nicht, ähm, weiß ich nicht, keine Ahnung. Also auf jeden Fall hat keine Auswirkungen. Oh mein Gott, diese verschissene Musik. Hello. I hope you found this documentary to be eye-opening. As you know, for the past couple episodes, we've been covering drugs and homelessness, particularly focused on providing a historical analysis of how many of America's current open-air drug markets came to be. But what about the flip side of the coin? What doesn't get much coverage is places where all drugs, or even the consumption of alcohol, are outlawed, and prohibition is militantly enforced by a standing army of beach cops. Many of you, especially Philadelphians of Irish and Italian descent, may be aware of the gorgeous beach town of Ocean City, New Jersey, an all-American summer vacation town, which sports the number one lowest crime rate in America. And it's been this way for over a hundred years. Founded by Methodist women associated with the temperance movement in the late 1800s who wanted to create a strict moral environment as opposed to nearby Atlantic City. Ocean City is the only town on the Jersey Shore that's refused to lift the ban on alcohol, even after Prohibition ended in 1933. So directly after filming in Philadelphia, we decided to drive to Ocean City, aka Reverse Kensington, to do some interviews. And Reverse Kensington einfach? Go undercover to see how dry this town really is. My name is Andrew Callahan, and you're watching Party Pooper. Hey, what are you doing? Are you drinking beer? Oh, fuck, we got one right here. We got a live teenager right here. He's coming down here to drink beer. He's got lemonade and vodka in there. Take that shit out of town. You guys fuck with King Von? Fuck yeah, yeah, fuck yeah, 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 y
If you'd like to see our new episode, Ocean City Streets, go to our Patreon, www.patreon.com slash channel5. As many of you know, Patreon supports our entire independent production budget, as well as gives you access to exclusive cuts of uncensored, extended, and unreleased content that we can't show anywhere else. If you enjoy our journalism and want to support, it would mean a lot if you could sign up. Take care. Hier ist der Link zu diesem sehr großartigen Video, muss man mal sagen. Hier ist der Link zu diesem großartigen Video. Channel 5 macht wirklich sehr, 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 sehr gute Videos, sehr ungefiltert. So ungefiltert, dass ich teilweise Bedenken hatte, sie zu zeigen in, in gewissen Teilen. Ich, ich, ähm, ich denke aber, dass das hier, das, was wir hier sehen, so ein bisschen die nächste Entwicklung von Nachrichten ist wie sie halt auch hätte sein sollen, als das erste Mal unabhängige Medienkonzerne sich im Internet formiert haben. Das ist schon sehr, sehr crazy. Ich gucke da immer wieder gerne rein. Es ist schon, es ist, es macht, es macht auch Bock. Es macht auch Bock, da mal so eine Sicht zu bekommen. Und das, die ganz seichte Mischung mit diesen Spitzen und teilweise auch Memes und Sachen, die da aber auch vorurteilsfrei berichtet werden, schon sehr krass. <lacht>